ThinkPads have had multiple different kinds of charging cables in the past. Coming from these horrible things to the standard barrel jack that most ThinkPads had and then going to this square thingy and now the newest ones have USB-C. So I started to wonder how difficult could it be to adapt my rectangular charging thingy to a USB-C charging thingy. So I got to work. USB-C charging is a bit of a weird one because the device and the charger can communicate and then decide on which voltages should the charger supply to the device that wants to charge. We're going to skip over all over how this is actually done and we're just going to concentrate on the fact that we need 20 volts and how do we get the USB-C charger to provide us with 20 volts. And to do that, we need something that will communicate with the charger. And here is the device. This is a USB-C power delivery emulator. And what it'll, it will do is it will communicate a certain voltage requirement to the charger and the charger will then provide it. So the emulator will request from the charger, please give me 20 volts and the charger will then oblige and give you 20 volts. The way that the ThinkPad charging works, however, is not exactly like that, that you can just plug 20 volts into it. It will require you to tell what kind of charger are you using, because there are several different ones. And we're going to have to do some extra work for that. We will also need a housing for the chip, because it's very small and doesn't exactly take the same amount of space as the old one. So we'll be removing the old part from the machine. We're going to then measure it. And with the measurements, we're going to go to Fusion 360 and we will model the housing. We only recorded the modeling in Fusion 360 using OBS, but OBS decided to crash during the recording and it corrupted the recording. So it's going to have to do it in another way. So I took the measurements of the original receptacle by removing it from the ThinkPad and then just measuring it. And this is exactly the same size. And then I took the measurements from the USB-C receptacle. And this is, a, this is a tiny bit bigger. It's 0 0.2 millimeters bigger in all dimensions so that we can actually fit it in. And even then, we need to do a little bit of extra work. We need to... Uh, use a knife or some sandpaper to actually carve out this a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Um, it's just the mar margin of error is so close, so that we get a very, very snug fit. And then we have the actual hole where all of the electronics will sit. And that is pretty much the right size. I had to do a couple of different versions, every time increasing it a little bit so that I would be able to fit the, the chip inside. And I then did some fillets to the ends because 3D printers don't like to do 90 degree angles, so the fillets will help a tiny, tiny bit. But yeah, that's the housing for the power delivery model module. Now that we have our model, we'll pop it into Slicer. And since I modeled it the wrong way around, we're going to have to turn it so that we get the best possible way of printing it. I had some problems with the lower part here because the, it's so thin that the slicer sometimes decided that, hey, yeah, you don't need to print this. So I needed to thicken it so that there would be at least one layer. And then we're going to go and check that we have brim which we don't have so we'll put five millimeters otherwise i had some problems trying to get this thing to stick to the print bed so we'll go with that and otherwise we're just going to use the 0.2 millimeter quality and here we go here's the sliced part so as we can see this is only one nozzle width 
And once that's done, this will print out in, in roughly 10 minutes. So it's mostly empty with some part stuff in the in the front. Here's the printed piece with the brim still attached. It's going to replace this part here, which is the power connector. And as we can see, it's the same size. Here is the PD emulator or, or the power delivery module. And as we can see, it'll fit right inside the printed piece. And here we have it fitted snugly inside. Now we'll go ahead and remove the original one and see that the both the block plus the power delivery module will actually fit in the place of the original connector. And as we can see, it fits nicely. There's even some space for the wires that we'll have to wire in. And here we can see that it actually looks kind of nice. So with that, we can move on to the next part, which is taking out the original connector in its entirety and removing the cabling and soldering the new power module in its place. Desoldering the wires from the connector is going to be rather easy since we can just pull these heat shrink tubes from the connectors and then desolder every one of them. So we'll get onto that. So it helps to have a mini vice when you're desoldering things. I'll link the one that I used in the description. But now that all of the wires have been desoldered, we can then solder them into the new power module. First, we'll do the positive, which is conveniently red in these cables and then the ground which conveniently is black in these cables and then we'll do the sensing pin which is white without soldering this pin correctly the uh, machine will not recognize the charger you can get it to do a fan spin but it won't actually boot using this uh, power supply with with the sensing pin missing and it cannot charge without it now, those who have been paying attention, in the beginning of this video, I showed a wiring diagram and it had a resistor on it. And that resistor corresponds with the different kinds of power supplies available. So, for example, 65 watt uses 285 ohms and 90 watt uses 548 ohms. So, we need to have a resistor that has one of these values so that the machine understands that, oh, this is the charger that has been plugged in. And since most of my power supplies are 65 watt, I'm going to use the 285 ohm resist resistance. There's a problem, however. I don't have a 285 ohm resistor so I'm going to have to make one and you can do this by just putting two resistors in series there is a calculator that I used to calculate a nice combination I used a 220 ohm plus a 68 ohm resistor which results in a 288 ohm resistor which is close enough now that we have our resistor, we need to solder it to the ground and the sensing pins. And the reason why I'm soldering it almost parallel to the ground pin 
is because that way we have enough space for the casing that's going to envelop the power delivery module and at the same time because the sensing lead is so short that otherwise it won't be able to reach. Here I'm just making sure that the resistor is working correctly and checking it with a voltmeter and it gives out the resistance being 287 ohms. Now that we have made sure that everything is working correctly, we'll just go ahead and solder in the sensing lead. Since the surface mount resistors are kind of fragile, I'm just dapping them in super glue to make sure that they can handle stresses of being inside the computer. Thinkpads are made out of a metal alloy. As such, if you don't insulate this power module, it will create sparks, as we can see here. So, in my case, I'm going to wrap this in Captain Tape. You may want to use shrink wrap, but I didn't have the proper size available, so I just used Captain Tape. Here we have the printed piece as it comes off the printer. So first we're going to remove the brim, then we're going to trim the edges, then we're going to see how well the module fits into the cavity and then trim off the excess so that we can get a snug fit. To get the proper insulation, I just pushed the device inside the 3D printer case and then wrapped the rest of it with the tape. To install the new module, we'll first start by removing the casing. We will then remove the display cable tensioning bracket, which also holds down the power cable. We will then remove the three screws holding down the display hinge and pull the hinge up so that we can get access to the power cable. And finally, we will remove the tensioning bracket from the power input itself and remove the power cable. Now the only thing left to do is to replace the old cable with the new USB-C one and then put the rest of the parts back in the reverse order. As we can see, the machine boots up fine and the new power module is providing power as expected and recharging the internal battery. The 3D printed enclosure file is in the video description and there is also a link to the power module where you can buy it. If this has been helpful, please click like and I'll thank you for watching.